It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's colloquium. Dr. Julie Allen is a professor of comparative arts and letters at, here at Brigham Young University, where she specializes in Scandinavian literature and culture. She is also the interim director of Global Women's Studies. Dr. Allen grew up in Hawaii, but traveled to Germany when she was 15 as an exchange student. She also served her mission in Denmark. Both experiences sparked her love of travel and inspired her current research and academic pursuits. She earned her bachelor's degree in German European Studies from Brigham Young University and later received her master's and PhD from Harvard University in Germanics, Languages, and Literatures with a minor in Scandinavian and Danish. Among her many awards are the Experience Research Fellowship for, um, from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, Donald R. and Jean F. Marshall Professorship from BYU College of Humanities, and the Humanities Center Fellowship from the BYU Humanities Center. Her research interests include Danish and German literature, Scandinavian history, and European silent film. Her most recent publications, Screening Europe in Australasia, Transnational Silent Film Before and After the Rise of Hollywood, and The Silent Muse, both focus on the life of the silent film star, Asta Nielsen. Dr. Allen's various publications center on answering the question, how do we know where we belong? Today, Dr. Allen will be sharing her latest research on the untold stories of Scandinavian Mormon women in Utah. Her presentation, titled In Search of Scandinavian Women in Utah, or How to Build a Public-Facing Research Database, will, will focus on the process of creating a publicly accessible database of these women's stories. We are honored to have Dr. Allen here today to share her insights and expertise with us. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much for that. It is such a pleasure to be here. This project is intimately related to my, my life as a member of the church, to Global Women's Studies, to BYU, and I see lots of faces in the audience who have intersected with it in many important ways. I want to start with a little personal story. I didn't know that I have a, one Danish great-great-grandmother whose name is Kan Kirstina Hammonstadopbeck until I was serving an LDS mission in Denmark a few years ago. When Georgia Nielsen, a local family history specialist in the Fredericia ward, encouraged my companion and me to do some family history work on our preparation day, I was quite surprised to discover that I had Scandinavian ancestry. It had always been hidden among my mom's predominantly Swiss family. So I'd always thought I knew my dad's Puritans and my mom's Swiss side, and then here's this one Danish girl. My mom's a Hafen, and all the stories I knew were about Hafens. So it was fun to research Kan Kistina's life to discover that she had been born and raised on a small island, just like I had, just on the other side of the globe. I come from verdant tropical Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands, while she came from rocky, windswept Bornholm in the Baltic Sea. With the help of some non-member family history patrons in the Fredericia area, I found out the name of the farm where Karen had been raised. The name is Guzminico, which means the farm where we remember the Lord. She was a religious person, she was the youngest of nine children while I was the fourth of eight, and she had joined the church in Denmark at the age of 22, which is almost exactly the age I was when I stumbled across her history um, on my mission. She immigrated to Utah together with her older brother, Anos, in 1854, leaving her widowed father and her five older sisters behind in Denmark. I am a, a woman of many sisters, and I know how hard that would be to separate yourself from your sisters. Um, and then when she got to Utah, her brother went north to Paris, Idaho, and she went south to Salt Lake and never saw him again. Um, since her daughter, Lenora Knight, was my mother's grandmother, I knew that Karen had married Samuel Knight and moved to Santa Clara, Utah, where she had six daughters and died at the age of 39. But that's about all I was able to find out about her at the time. And I didn't realize it as a young missionary but this project I'm talking about today to build a public-facing database of Scandinavian LDS women's histories started right there. I've since learned that there were literally thousands of Scandinavian women like Karen who encountered missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland in the mid-19th century and decided to change the course of their lives forever. As many as 25,000 Scandinavian women came to Utah between 1850 and 1920, helping to make Scandinavians the largest non-English-speaking ethnic group in territorial Utah. But as with Khan's invisibility in my family history, little is known about what happened to these women after they arrived, 
Where did they go? What was it like for them not only to change religions, but homelands and languages and foodscapes and climates and everything that went with it, along with converting and immigrating to Utah? How did their cultural identity as Scandinavians shape their experiences as pioneers? The bits and pieces I learned about Khan's story stuck with me for decades as I started my own family and pursued my academic goals, earning a PhD in Germanic languages and literatures, with Danish as a minor, as was mentioned. Since there were only five professorships of Danish in the country at the time, and now there are only four, I worked on Danish projects out of love for the language and culture, never expecting to be able to focus on Scandinavian studies full time. But the Lord had other plans for me. Just as he had led me to Cannes on my mission, he helped me get one of those five Danish professorships as my first tenure track professorial job in the Scandinavian Studies Department at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. As you can see from this chart, the majority of the nearly 3.5 million Scandinavians who came to the United States in the 19th and early 20th centuries settled in and around the Midwest, which is why the Scandinavian Studies Department in Madison um, could be founded there in 1875, the same year that BYU as a university was founded. Those Midwestern Scandinavians were overwhelmingly Lutherans, and their church congregations played a really important role in helping them maintain their ties to their language, their food traditions, their holidays, and their strong sense of connection to Scandinavia. For me, teaching Scandinavian studies at UW-Madison for the first decade of my career gave me a crash course in Scandinavian immigration history, one that illuminated many fascinating stories that make up the larger narrative of Scandinavian immigration to the U.S. I remember one semester when a student taking my Scandinavian immigration class went home to Minnesota and talked to their family at Thanksgiving, and they were driving by a cave, and her parents said, oh, that's where your great-grandparents lived when they came to Minnesota. And she had never known that that's where they lived, which was actually really common, you know, dugouts and caves and anywhere you could stay that was dry until you could build a house because there was nothing else on the prairie. So this awareness of the complexity and intricacy of Scandinavian Lutheran immigration piqued my interest in Scandinavian Mormon immigration history, which prompted me to research and write a book about what it felt like for 19th century Danes when more than 20,000 of their neighbors decided to join the LDS church and, in most cases, leave their friends, family, language, and homeland to come to Utah. In Danish but not Lutheran, I look at how various stakeholders in 19th and 20th century Danish culture from Lutheran ministers to street balladeers to silent film producers, engaged with the question of how religious and cultural identities intersect and shape each other. In the last chapter of the book, I focus in on the life stories and personal histories of various Danish convert immigrants to see how they felt about the consequences of their own momentous choice to gather to Zion. Each of their stories was distinct and, uh, distinctive and unique, but one common thread I found in my research was that even though slightly more Scandinavian women than men joined the LDS church and immigrated to Utah, most of the stories I found were about men. They were the ones who served missions, they were the ones who held prominent callings, they had a, a larger visibility in the community. So here on the um, bottom left, you can, oh, so bottom right, you can see um, Frederick, Frederick Ferdinand Samuelsen, who was the second member of the church ever elected to a national parliament after Reed Smoot here in Utah. On the left, you can see a farmer named Mass Newton with the wife he left behind in Denmark. She chose not to come, and he wrote her letters for the rest of his life, begging her to come because the Lord was coming and the, it, he needed her here, and she never came. On the top, you see a couple, Hans and Wilhelmina Marie Jakobsen Bolvi Jansen. Um, they really like names, um, who both immigrated separately and joined the church joined the church in Denmark, immigrated separately, met and married in Utah, and settled in Pleasant Grove. He went on a mission back to Denmark in 1881, and they wrote letters to each other. And I had the great privilege of being hired to translate their letters when I was, uh, when I was in my PhD program. And initially, the family only had his letters. And they were interesting letters about being a missionary in Denmark and what that felt like. But about three years later, the family had sold their uncle's house, and they had, the new owners had an electrician come in, and in the, da the attic, they found a box with her letters. And so I got to translate her letters back to him, and her letters were amazing. I mean, his were interesting, but hers were phenomenal, because I'd never heard a woman's voice the same way. I'd never heard how hard it was for her to have her husband leave her with five little children in a homestead in Pleasant Grove. She said, I'm fat, and it's hot, and I've never had to farm before. 
And she said, kids, pe- kids are mean to our kids in school because they say their dad has left. And people that keep asking me for money, do we owe them money? I mean, it's just, it's such a real vivid slice of her life. And so in my book, Mina's story is the only one I was able to tell, the only woman's story I was able to tell at any depth because I had those letters. And also, because I got to translate them, her family, for the first time, got to hear her voice, to know just how spunky and faithful and brave and smart she was. Um, they had been languishing untranslated for all those, all those decades. I'm actually currently in the process of publishing those letters, that correspondence, together some framing essays about what it was like for the Danes in Pleasant Grove and what it was like for Hans to go back to his homeland, the homeland he had left, um, as a missionary. So as a result of my work on this book, When I accepted a job at BYU in 2016, I was much more attuned to the presence of Scandinavians in Utah communities than I had been before, but also to their absence from Utah history and from the history of the church. I knew that over 45,000 Scandinavians had immigrated to Utah in that late 19th century period, somewhat more than half of them Danes, but I didn't have a clear sense of what the broader contours of their lived experiences were like. Just about every second person I meet here in Utah has Scandinavian ancestors, and some people know a great deal about their individual ancestors, but very few of us know much about the group. Historians like William Mulder have documented the mass conversion and immigration of Scandinavians to Utah in his phenomenal book from the 1950s, Homeward to Zion. And other people like Susan Easton Black have told the story of missionaries and their work going back to Denmark. Andrew, Je- uh, Andrew Jensen, the De- Scandinavian historian, has written a lot about Scandinavians in Utah and the Scandinavian mission, but no one has told the larger story of what Scandinavian convert immigrants' lives were like once they got here, and what role their cultural identity played in their adaptation to their home, their new home, new religion, and new communities. Though studies like Rachel Gianni Abbott's 2013 dissertation on the material culture of Scandinavian immigrants have made tremendously important contributions. This relative invisibility of Scandinavian immigrants is is particularly acute when it comes to Scandinavian women, as many women's stories, uh, many men's stories have been told in the context of missions and church service, while women's lives were often quieter, more grounded in one place. But I can tell you one thing I learned from Minnie's letters is that without the women back home, none of those missions would have happened. There wouldn't have been a church to come back to if it hadn't been the women guarding the home front, raising the children, harvesting the crops, writing the letters, finding the money to send to their husbands to keep them on their missions, and really lifting the church where they stood. So with all these stories and questions swirling around in my head, I was eager to find a way to gather the stories of Scandinavian LDS women in such a way as to make future research into their lives and experiences possible, both micro histories, um, like my own great-great-grandmother, but also the macro history of what was it like for this group of women to shape this new place. I also knew, though, given that there were you know, approximately 25,000 first-generation Scandinavian women, that I could never, ever accomplish this project on my own, even if I worked on it for the rest of my career. The answer I found was to get help, to recruit a team of bright, motivated student researchers to join me on the journey to track down Scandinavian women who came to Utah and let their voices be heard. Since humanities faculty don't tend to do a lot of collaborative big data projects, the two main challenges to building that team were funding and staffing, and Global Women's Studies answered both. In late 2021, I was awarded an Emline B. Wells grant by Global Women's Studies to pursue this project, so I immediately put out a call for interested researchers to join the team. I planned to hire two or three women to help me uh, over the course of the two years of the grant, but everyone I met was so excited and so motivated and so smart that I hired 10. (laughs) And then a couple more. So I ended up with a team of about 12 researchers, um, nearly all of them GWS minors, who were eager to tackle this daunting task of finding and identifying these thousands of Scandinavian women. In uh, January 2022, this is part of the team, we began meeting every week or so to develop the project, to meet with research uh, experts in the field, to determine best practices, share resources, and report our results to each other, and become friends. I think it's been a really tremendous experience for all of us to have this group of, of, of people to work with and nerd out about when you find somebody who had a fascinating story um, and or endured terrible things. I don't want to steal any of Amanda or Rebecca's thunder from their own stories, but they've, it's been amazing things we've found. And so 
I initially thought I would just do a Qualtrics survey and ask people about their Scandinavian ancestors and sort of you know, collect some of that data. And I did do that, and I got about 180 responses. But that was very clearly not going to be the way to get to 25,000 Scandinavian women. And so we decided to approach the task systematically in order to collect the names of as many Scandinavian women as possible from census records. So we concentrated our initial efforts on the Utah counties that had the highest density of Scandinavians, Sevier, San Pete, Tooele, Salt Lake, Uinta, Cache, Box Elder, and Utah counties. In some cases, such as in San Pete County, immigrants from Scandinavia were instructed to settle in certain parts of the state, where they formed tight-knit ethnic communities that conducted church services in Danish and celebrated Scandinavian holidays. And so it was really clear, like everybody knew that there were Scandinavians there. And in fact, I should probably put in a plug for the annual Scandinavian festival held on the ground of Snow College in Ephraim every year. This year, it's May 26th to 27th. Got a very strong Viking flavor, uh, <laughs> which, you know, is not, it's a little anachronistic for 19th century Scandinavians, but, and also there are no horns on Viking helmets, just to say. So we know about the Scandinavians in St. Pete and Sevier, but in other areas like Pleasant Grove, Scandinavian settlers weren't sent there. They just ended up there. They were attracted by the presence of friends or family or simply invited by local residents to stay. One of the stories I really like about the founding of the Scandinavian community in Pleasant Grove is the story of the Warnick family. They crossed from Sweden, 11 members of the family crossed the ocean and cholera hit their ship. And they came across the plains and found cholera in Iowa again. So by the time they got to Utah, only four members of the family were still alive. And they were traveling down from Salt Lake to go to San Pete to join the Scandinavians, and they were so tired. They were so tired of travel, they were so tired of loss, and they stopped one night in Pleasant Grove, and a Swede named Paul Anderson, Anderson, sorry, Danish got me there, sorry, ch chips, like, cringing. Um, he came out and met their, met their camp and said, come stay with me in my dugout, stay and rest a while. And they are still there. The Warnicks are a pillar of, <laughs> of Pleasant Grove society, and they've been there ever since. Paul Anderson um, invited them to stay. So, um, oh, this is, uh, yeah. Um, working in tombs of two or three, my research assistants began identifying Scandinavian women across territory Utah, by town by town, county by county, census by census. And if that sounds tedious, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so many hours spent, I think actually 2,300 women hours in, fall, in, in 2022 alone um, was spent just on going through the census and trying to track down each person. You can see here, so here's 1,900 Sevier County, got the different towns that were in Sevier County, and then for each town, going through and finding every Scandinavian woman, the data from the census, who she married, who her children were, who was living in her, in her household, what her occupation was, and just trying to make sure we could find them all. Um, so with these Google spreadsheets with the names and vital information, occupation, nationality, um, we've done them for all these counties that we've been working on. And there are still counties we haven't started. Um, Weber, Washington, San Juan are all waiting. So if anyone's really interested, there's more data extraction to be done. Um, but as a result of this really tedious, careful work, we have been able to generate lists of Scandinavian women living in each of these counties um, for each decade during the period of peak Scandinavian immigration to Utah, except, I should note, for 1890 to 1900, since that entire federal census was lost to fire. And it breaks my heart every time we get to the missing 1890 census. But these lists form the foundation of our database and can be expanded in future with these additional counties in Utah, in Idaho, in Nevada, as well as supplemented with the data from women who didn't make it onto the census for various reasons. These lists already come in very handy when people ask me about whether we've been able to find and include their ancestors in this project. Just yesterday, a Swedish friend of mine who lives in the UK, who is herself a convert to the church and has always thought she was the first convert in her family, sent me an image from a Swedish church record she found on Ancestry.com that shows her grandfather's aunt listed as having joined Mormonkirken, the Mormon church. The friend, her, my friend hadn't realized she had relatives who joined the church before her. Her grandfather's aunt was born in 1857 and named Johanna Louisa Seth. So I began looking for her in our data set. So very grateful to people who've done all the, the counties. And I found her as Johanna Christofferson on the 1920 census in Manti, where she had settled after immigrating to Utah at the age of 60 and marrying a man named Emil Christofferson in 1918. 
going back to my friend, I was able to find out that Johanna had been married in Sweden to Carl Theodor Stavland, with whom she'd had children, all of whom died quite young, one of them possibly while in prison in Stockholm. After joining the church and coming to Utah, Johanna married two more times, first Emil Christofferson, and then in March 1929, another Swede named John Hulteström. She died in Salt Lake City in October 8, 1954, apparently without descendants. So her story hasn't been told, and this is the first chance we get to see the things she must have suffered and the things she must have rejoiced in. So once we'd begun compiling these lists of women, our next task was start, start looking for more information about individual women on the list, these micro-histories, preferably through personal histories or life sketches, but also in newspapers, local histories, Relief Society minute books, and the like. The wonderful digitized resources of Family Search, Ancestry.com, BYU Special Collections, and the Church History Library have been integral to making this task possible, allowing us to build on the work that many other people have already done. We have collectively traced the lives of dozens of women so far, finding out where they came from in Scandinavia, how and when they encountered the LDS Church, when and how they crossed the ocean and the plains, where they settled, and then what they did once they got here, where they settled and for how long, who they married and how many wives he already had, how many children they bore and lost, what professions they pursued, and what challenges and opportunities they faced in their lives. As we've researched individual women's lives, we've found heartwarming stories, such as one of two friends, this is one of Becca's, from Sweden who converted and emigrated together, singing Swedish hymns together off and on throughout their lives. Heartbreaking stories, another one of Becca's, including many of mothers losing multiple children to disease. And head-scratching stories, this is Amanda's, of including one of two sisters who fell in love with two brothers, but when the older brother died, he made his surviving brother promise to marry the wife he was leaving behind instead of her sister, whom he really loved, which caused no end of confusion and frustration to all the parties. <laughs> it has been thrilling to find photographs and documents about the women whose names we had found in the census that bring them back to life, at least in our imaginations. It's also a privilege to get to share these findings with other people. In fact, three of my students, including Amanda and Becca, will be presenting on their findings about Danish and Swedish women in Utah at this year's Mormon History Conference in Rochester. So it's really exciting, and if you're going to be in Rochester, you should totally go and support them. It's going to be amazing. So as we were finding our way around the various websites and online repositories that contain information about the lives of Scandinavian convert immigrant women, a scholar I know shared with us a collection of life histories of Utah women that were collected in the 1930s as part of the Works Project Administration. As soon as I opened the folder, I saw a file titled, titled Life of Caroline Beck Knight. From the family history work I'd done on my mission, I knew that Khan Christina Hamansara Beck had anglicized her name at some point after arriving in Utah to Caroline Beck. So I knew this had to be my great-grandmother's -grand story, recorded more than 60 years after her death. Reading about her conversion in 1853, her transatlantic voyage, the cholera that nearly killed her brother and did take her niece's life, and the chronic illness that she endured the last 13 years of her life made her suddenly seem real to me. The life sketch touches on many topics, from her literacy to her interactions with Native Americans that intersect with her cultural identity in ways that we rarely talk about, and it made me wish she had kept a diary or left a collection of letters behind with more information about how she felt about all these adventures and trials. I don't get to know, but I, we can find out for other people, and we want to make it available to other people so that I don't have to go one by one to each of my relatives and say, did you know about our Danish great-great-grandmother? I mean, I actually have been doing that <laughs> for a couple of years now. But, um, so for more than a year, we've been working with the BYU Office of Digital Humanities, primarily the infinitely patient faculty liaison Brian Croxell, shout out to Brian, and his student developers to build a public-facing database to house the information that we've been gathering and make it available to amateur and professional historians alike. Jenica Freeman in the College of Humanities Digital Media Office designed an amazing logo for us, which is the focal point of our homepage, which has red and blue stripes that are slightly reminiscent of the Danish and Norwegian flags. I, just, I love how the woman is hidden there in the words um, and yet visible to us. Building this database and website has been a long, iterative process that has involved a lot of thinking about what it is people will want to know and how best to convey it. We don't want to duplicate what Family Search and Ancestry are already doing. We want to gather enough stories of individual Scandinavian convert immigrant women that people will be able to do their own qualitative research into the lives of um, their own ancestors and the community at large, to write that comprehensive history that still needs telling. We want to make their lives, both individually and collectively, available 
and for people to, who use the site to be able to see how each woman's life played out and how it related to those of her neighbors, family, and friends. So to standardize our data entry, we decided to focus on the women, making female the default sex for each person we entered into the database and making the defining events in her life at marking the defining events, birth, conversion, emigration, immigration, marriage, children, and death. Nothing was as simple as we expected it to be, however. One of the first challenges we encountered was already familiar to me from my efforts to find out more about Khan Kistina Hemansad of Beck, also known as Caroline Beck Knight. The fact that most of these women's, women were known by many different names throughout their lives, and that many have nearly identical names, such as Anna Maria Anderson or Johanna Peterson. And since Scandinavians tend to use a limited number of given names over and over again, even within the same families. Many 19th century Scandinavians are known by multiple surnames, while some Scandinavian immigrants change the spelling of their given names, either by preference or the, for the convenience of English speakers, as my great-great-grandmother's shift from Khan Kistina to Caroline illustrates. To complicate matters, many Scandinavian women immigrants changed or added to their surnames when they were married, as Caroline Beck did when she married Samuel Knight, and some married more than once, acquiring a string of surnames. As historian Michelle Gaubach told us when she visited our team last year to talk about her dissertation on Danish convert immigrant women in Utah, which she will be defending to earn her doctoral degree tomorrow, yay Michelle, sometimes these Scandinavian women use different names to demarcate different aspects of their lives. One example she showed us, and whom she ended up writing about extensively in her dissertation, was a Danish poet named Kistina Sophie Hansen who published extensively in the Juvenile Instructor and in other publications under her married, anglicized name, Sophie Valentine. <laughs> so you wouldn't know that Sophie Valentine and Christina Sophie Hansen are the same person unless you've done all this background work. So for our uh, book, we've decided to use, uh, for our website, to use the name by which the person was known throughout most of her life or what was listed on her gravestone and her obituary, but to include fields for alternate given names and alternate surnames to make it easier to identify specific individuals. It will take us years, <laughs> but our plan is to create a profile page for each woman on the list that we've created from the census data, containing a photograph if we can find one, the names by which she was known, the dates of her birth and death, information about any marriages and her children, about the timing of her immigration to Utah, and a listing of the places she lives. We want to tell a brief life story for each woman, then link to the websites where information about her is available. So I just want to show you just one example of this. Um, we're working on it, and this I think was one of Amanda's. Um, this is Sharsti. Um, so she's known by as Charsti in English, but Shesti in Swedish. Um, Christina Larsen Joransson. Joransson. Um, so her alternate names are Christina or Christina. Her married name is Joransson or Jorgensen or Larsen. <laughs> you can find all these variations. She was born in Sweden in Södra Salorup and she married Lars Peter Joransson in 1858. Um, but it ended in 1868 in Moroni, presumably when he died. We see that she then married Jan Nils Larsson, so that's where you get the Joransson and the Larsson names, um, the following year um, in 1869, which lasted for th nearly 30 years. Um, I'm assuming it's his death. Um, let's see, when did she die? Yeah, it must be his, because she lived in 1908. Um, we can see her children, many of them, uh, we can see her parents, we can see a little bit about her emigration, where she left Sweden and arrived in Salt Lake, where she died in Moroni, and then we have a life story pieced together from fam family search and ancestry and the documents that people have provided um, to help us understand more about her experience. Then we have the links to the records, you can click right through to family search and find all the documents that we used here to Saints by Sea to see where she crossed the ocean, and then you can see who did this amazing work. And people can take their hats off to Amanda Reese forever, say thank you for bringing Sharsti back into our, our stories. Right now we're just focusing on the first generation Scandinavian born women. So while Sharsti's husband and children appear in the database, they don't have the same degree of information. It's just Sharsti that we get a biography for. We plan to allow people to search for Scandinavian women in Utah, not only by name, which will be the category on the left, but also by the places they came from, the countries of origin, and then within that, the towns and counties, and then from the places they settled. So someday, when this website is more developed, you should be able to click through Utah communities, click on Moroni, and see all the women that Sharsti was hanging out with and inter interacting with and understanding a little more about the communities that were being built, formal and informal communities, um, in all these, these, these towns in Utah. 
We also plan to make it possible for users to submit information about their own Scandinavian ancestors to be added to the database, since we know that there are doubtless thousands of women who have fallen through the cracks of our search, <clears throat> whether because they came and left again between censuses, were recorded on the missing 1890 census, or misidentified by census takers, to name just a few possibilities. One example of this is Anna Helena Warnick, who died of cholera while crossing the plains <clears throat> on her way to Utah from Sweden in 1866. I mentioned her before. She never got here to be recorded in the census. Another is Inger Mortensen, who left Denmark in 1857 with her husband Christian and five small children. After crossing the Atlantic from Liverpool to Philadelphia, her family joined a handcar company in Iowa City, and they made it as far as 100 miles past Omaha by June, but then her husband got sick. And so they dropped out of the handcart train, found a dugout to buy, and stayed there for three years. Um, Actually, no, it's more than three years in the dugout. Then they move into Council Bluffs and then into Omaha. And it's not until February, uh, sorry, November of 1861 that they get to Utah. And um, Inga has devoted herself to the church, to her family, has crossed the plains. And then in February 1862, just a few months after their arrival, Inga died in childbed. So her name was never recorded in the U.S. Census in Utah. So we would never have found her. Fortunately, the Daughters of Utah Pioneers have recorded lots of personal stories, and so I was able to find out about Inga from this biography of her daughter, written by her granddaughter, um, and recover her and put her in our database. So all the work we've done so far, as exhausting as it has been for the students who are working on it, as exhilarating as it has been, um, is merely preliminary. Because the ultimate goal of this entire project is to make this website a repository of the publicly available primary source documents about Scandinavian women in Utah. We don't want to tell the stories. We want other people to have access to the stories and be able to tell those stories as well. Not ever is as fortunate as Anna Karina Gordon Witzo, whose son, John A. Witzo, wrote a biography of his mother called In the Gospel Net. So all y'all, the bar is high. Biographies of your mother. <laughs> um, it's a good standard of, of, of filial piety. Um, but most of the Scandinavian women immigrants we know of or that came are known in fa small family circles or not at all. So now that we have the bones of the website built, we've started entering women's information into it um, and creating box folders for each woman create, containing whatever documents we've been able to find for her. So I was able to upload, I did a profile of my great-great-grandmother and uploaded that document from the WPA interviews, created one for Inger Mortensen and uploaded this document so that people in future can find their ancestors, find their friends, find the communities that they're part of. Some of these documents are already available in publicly accessible databases, um, like the Church History Library, and so we can just link to those ones. Um, other ones are are not digitized and available. So um, one example of the former, the digitized, is the letters of the Norwegian-American Saini Peterson Lund, who wrote to her missionary husband, Anton Lund, who was an apostle, um, which former church history sites director, or church historical sites director, Jenny Lund, is writing a book about. Jenny Lund is a great story, too. She married a Lund, and he wasn't a member of the church, and she wasn't a member of the church, and then they discovered that they were descended from Anton Lund, who was the first Danish apostle, and it was all very exciting. And so she got excited by this, has, has traced their letters, and is writing a book about it, and we're hoping to, we're, we've applied to have those letters digitized for the church history website. But there are other ones that are not available, um, and these histories, like this one of um, Caroline Hansen Adams and her mother, Inger Mortensen, are not available in any digital form, and so we're hoping to get these scanned and uploaded to our site so people can find them. So all the work that Dot Adams Racker did to tell her mother's and grandmother's stories won't be lost. There are many primary source documents all around. They're housed in local historical archives and libraries, but I have a sneaking suspicion that most of them are in people's private collections. They're in people's attics and memory books and basements. And so the only way this project really works is if people get excited about it and go out and find their own family stories and bring them to us and let them put them up here so there's a central place to identify and access these stories and discover the foremothers that we never knew we had. Until now, what historians have been able to learn about Scandinavian women in Utah has been largely anecdotal and haphazard, governed by happenstance. But we want to make it possible for it to be systematic and thoughtful and intentional. Like the letters of Hans and Minnie Jorgensen that I was privileged to be able to translate, I'm convinced there's a treasure trove of letters, diaries, personal histories, and other documents 
created by or about Scandinavian convert immigrant women in private collections. If we can find them, get permission to scan them and upload them to our site, connect them to the profiles of the women who wrote them or about whom they are written, this database will become an unparalleled resource for people trying to understand the Scandinavian convert immigrant experience. I've got good news. A team of researchers led by Lane Welch, Rosalind Fanchon was daughter, child, will be working on this aspect of the project over the summer, tracking down leads from our original Qualtrics survey, going to local historical archives, trying to find these documents and connecting them here. So it's an honors project, and I'm so excited that this is what they've chosen to use their project for, to help really bring about this part of the project, to make these documents available. And I'm convinced that this database will be a force for good, turning the hearts of children to their foremothers and making it possible for the first time to answer the questions that I had about Khan Christina Hammond's data Beck. What was it like to be a non-English speaker, convert immigrant in territorial Utah? How did it feel to have to negotiate a new language, new country, new culture, new religion, new climate, and new social context? What were the challenges and what were the rewards? I'm convinced that if our goal is to be saved together with our ancestors and our descendants, we're going to have to get to know each other. And I think getting a jump on that right now will enrich our lives and enrich those relationships that we are hoping to establish in the hereafter. And I'm so grateful that Global Women's Studies has been able to support this, that BYU has supported it, that Global Women's Studies minors have been excited about this project and have helped build the, this database. And I hope that all of you will go home today or write to your parents today and say, who do we have? What Scandinavians do we have so we can, we can bring this family back together? So thanks so much for listening. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen's research is centered on her interest of examining history through particular lenses of identity. In this case, how Scandinavian Mormon women immigrants interact with their religion and their identity in a foreign country and culture, both on a macro and a micro level. One of her main questions she strives to answer in her research is, how do we know where we belong? She's currently working on answering this question through her work on a groundbreaking database, Scandinavian LDS Women. Dr. Allen has created a space where women researchers and readers can both find and eventually add journal entries and personal information on these Scandinavian women. This space is important for diversifying the established Mormon history and primary resources we rely on to understand these foundational years of the Mormon church. These journal entries and letters of Scandinavian women immigrants opens up the canon to include women's experiences, their thoughts on subjects such as the word of wisdom and polygamy, and shows us as contemporary researchers and readers of women's studies, problems, and experiences that we may generalize and overlook nu nuances of these women's experiences. Through her contributions to early Mormon primary resources, Dr. Julie Allen is placing women's experiences alongside men's, insisting their experiences are as important as early male saints. Our experiences as non-men, both women and non-binary people, are valuable equally to those as of the Scandinavian women converts that Dr. Julie Allen spoke about. Her dedication to researching and sharing this information can motivate us to share our own experiences and more importantly, lift up the experiences of others who have been marginalized in the LDS culture and church here at our university and outside of it. Thank you. So we will be beginning the question and answer portion of today's lecture, and I would like to begin by asking you, Dr. Allen, um, a question. So digging in and finding stories of these women rather than just finding dates sounds super tedious, but fantastic. Um, these stories can humanize our Scandinavian foremothers and help us build connections to our ancestries. I'm wondering if you can share with us one of your favorite stories that you found about these women. Thanks, Rebecca. It's a great question. I actually ought to call up Amanda and, and Becca because I have mostly just been able to watch my researchers doing all this work and see them finding great things. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, more about Mina Jorgensen, who is the person I've worked the most on, and she's kind of, I feel like we're related, even though we're not, but like we're sisters in Christ, right? We're sisters in Zion. And she is, um, 
you know, like I mentioned, she was not a farmer. She had never had to farm before her husband left on his mission. And she was really worried about what it would mean for her, for him to go. And so she writes letters that are both tender and bold. And she says, you know, don't show these letters to anybody because I don't write well. But I'm so glad that he kept them anyway <laughs> because um, I get to see what it feels like to not, not know what you're doing and yet do it anyway. And so she has to go out and farm and she has to plant the crops and she's worried about it and she writes to him, am I watering too much? Am I watering too little? I don't know. And it's like six weeks later when he gets it, she gets an answer. He can't possibly know, but she's just venting. Um, and then when her harvest turns out good, well, and she's done a good job, she writes, I'm a pretty good little farmer after all. <laughs> And she tells him how much she, how many bushels she'd harvested and how much she'd earned. And I just was so proud of her. I was like, you go, girl. You got this, right? And there's another time when she writes to him. Actually, the first letter she writes to her husband after he gets to Denmark, she says, women over there look at a man from Zion or cling to a man from Zion like vines to an apple tree. Don't you forget you have a wife and five children back home. <laughs> and so he never did take a second wife. But understanding that the dynamics were complicated, that these were not the people, I mean, they had given up everything to come to Utah. They believed in the church 100%, but it didn't mean it was easy for them. And I feel like that's a really important lesson for me is that the challenges I'm facing, the way my faith is tested and tried, that's the plan. That's the way it's always been. And I think we don't do, we do ourselves a disservice when we idealize our ancestors, like, oh, they're super easy for them. They buried five children and didn't blink, right? <laughs> Becca can talk about one of her women who did bury the four or five that died of Six, seven, <laughs> yeah, seven. And she like had a mental breakdown and her husband came over his mission and thought he'd lost her and she had to get a apostolic blessing really to get her to have the courage to stand up and have five, Becca, five or six more? Seven, seven more. <laughs> so she really like, she believed that blessing. So that's one of my favorite stories. questions here in the audience, feel free to line up here. We do have a question on Zoom from Valeria Valentini. Oh, okay. That are going to be asked by <laughs> our friends here. Well done. Okay, yeah. She just asks, in your research, which were the problems Scandinavian women had to face the most? Thanks. So one of the problems that we find is just that the total incomprehension of their neighbors. Like, why would you do this? Like, this is such a strange thing. And so a lot of the women who join the church in Denmark and in, in Scandinavia are, are hurt by the rejection by their neighbors. They're, they lose their jobs. They, their kids get, have get in trouble at school. And so then they cross the ocean. But that in itself is a terrifying prospect, especially in the 1850s. You know, they call the ships coffin ships because people die in such vast numbers crossing the ocean. And so like the Warnick family to say, we believe this, we want to go, and then have seven of their 11 family members die along the way, I think is a, a tremendous challenge that shows how much faith they had, but also how hard it was. And so then they've gone through all these hard things at home, they've gone through all these hard things, and then they come here and people call them dumb Swedes. And they tell them, they call them dirty Danes, right? And they get looked down on by their neighbors. And in a place where they're trying to be one, I think that's a really hard thing, that they've come and sacrificed so much, and then people laugh at them for the way they speak. And so I think that probably would be the hardest thing, because they probably came here expecting Zion and found people instead. And of course, we know that's how Zion is built, out of people. But um, understanding some of those, those nuances is, I think, one of the most important parts of this project. And then we have another question from Zoom from Natalie, and it says, what is the significance of women today searching for the lost stories of Scandinavian immigrants in the 19th century Utah? How does it inspire them? Thanks. I think it's really what um, Elise said in her response, right, that our lives matter, um, that we think that, oh, you know, I can throw away all my letters, I can delete all my emails, no one's going to care about my pictures, but they will, they do. That's how we tell our stories, this linking ourselves together. And so as my parents have been going through old documents, my dad will be like, oh, I don't know who these people are. I should throw this out. I'm like, don't you dare. <laughs> this is really, somebody will know it. Somebody will care. Um, in my book about silent film, I was um, researching film distributors in Australia. And there was a woman who always used the name Mrs. Clement Mason. And I couldn't figure out, it took me years to figure out who she was. 
um, and I found out because she was using her husband's name, and her name was actually Mary Norton, and he died after they'd been married for nine months, and she carried on his film business using his name because it gave her more of a sort of credential, and I never knew what she looked like. I couldn't find a picture, and I had never seen a picture of him either, and one day on Ancestry, I was poking around for some Scandinavian stuff, and I just thought, I'm going to look up Mary Norton, and I looked her up, and I found her marriage, her wedding picture, Mary and Clement Mason, when they were married in 1916, and so I wrote to the person on Family Search and just said, hey, can I get a copy, and she said, sure, and so it's in my book, and I feel it's this amazing reminder that nobody's life is worthless. Nobody's life is meaningless. Everybody has a story to tell, and it's worth remembering that for ourselves, for our, our siblings, for our friends, for our parents, and, and really cherishing that. So what if we, in researching our own um, Scandinavian ancestors, find some really good stories? How do we contribute kind of thing? Yeah, so we're working on getting a, a way to just submit a form on the website where you can say, hey, I've got this question, and a researcher will reach out to you to get that information, and we can you know, put it in together. Because um, I think there are lots of stories out sure, there. Yeah. And so we thought about just having sort of an open drop box, but then people said, no, you'll get a lot of crap. So, uh, <laughs> okay, we'll make it like a, a contact form where people can reach out with their stories. And so that's, that's the plan. Coming. Okay. So I have sort of a methodological question. Um, you know, Ancestry and Family Search are incredible resources, full of amazing materials, but they're they're amateur, right? Their 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 family histories and our family histories can be biased in important ways. They can just be flat wrong, with no ill will, right? This is just the nature of stories. Are you able to do any kind of fact checking, or do you just kind of put them up there with the understanding that, you know, these are family histories and they reflect the understandings, not necessarily the historical facts on the ground? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, to some extent, we do both. Like, we, the documents as they're written, we just will put them up because that is the way the story was told. But for the profiles and the database, that's why we started with the census, was try to get as much fact as we could and then compare that to, like, immigration records from Saints at Sea or the handcar companies and try to get as much verification as we can. Because sometimes things happen, like one of my researchers wrote to me and said, this woman Mary, or this, this couple Mary and John are listed, and Mary's listed as a man. Is this a gay marriage? I said, it's probably a typo. Like, that, that's... <laughs> That's 1860, this is not going to be a thing you find. Um, and so not trying to read things into documents and trying to make it tell a story it's not telling. And so we do want it to be as accurate as possible, and that's hence the attention to all the names, because they change names all the time, and it'd be easy to think, oh, these are all different people or having different experiences, when in fact they're just stories that are being told in different, different vernaculars, I guess. Despite show of hands, how many of you have a Scandinavian ancestor? See, it's amazing. <laughs> and how many know anything about your Scandinavian ancestor? Okay, so it's about maybe half, right? I think there's just, I mean, my, my journey of discovering my own Danish great-great-grandmother has made me feel more connected to all of my ancestors, recognizing that each of them has a story. When I think about Kan Kistina Hamonstadopek living in her wagon box in Mountain Meadows where her first child was born, um, shortly before the Mountain Meadows Massacre when she was asked to help raise the orphans from that massacre. And they say that she never had a day of health in her life after her first child was born for want of care. And that she raised her, her own chickens and she sold the eggs to travelers, that she made her own cotton cloth that she was, in Whitney's history of Utah, said to be the first woman to introduce cotton cloth weaving in Utah. Um, that she raised these six girls even though she only got to live to be the, old, till the oldest was 13, it just makes me want to be better. It makes me want to be stronger, right? And I feel like knowing that she could live through those things and still contribute so much to her family and to me is really inspirational. So just a reason to get up in the morning sometimes. And, you know, when I'm procrastinating or, no, <laughs> last, last Saturday for some reason it felt really, really urgent to make 
pumpkin bread and banana bread and paper, uh, <laughs> rather than doing the things I really needed to be doing, I thought, well, maybe someday people say, well, she was a great pumpkin bread baker. In fact, that may be the only thing that I make that my 12-year-old daughter likes. So uh, that will be in my obituary, that she made amazing pumpkin bread. <laughs> Thank you for answering our questions. Everyone, please join me in thanking Dr. Allen for her presentation.